And I think lastly, it might be neat to just talk a little bit about our nasopelatine canal uh, approach with regard to um, what we like to do. I know you like to lateralize that bundle. You've published a nice article on that with um, right. some co-authors, including So basically, we include it in the Palatino flap. We gently, yeah. sure, gently if you push may it out. Care to comment on that just a little bit? Um, so <clears throat> I was trained to excoclate the nerve. And I did. And, and no patient ever complained, honestly. But then, you know, all of a sudden, when we started to do a lot, of, lot more augmentations, more, a, lot more a lot more severe defects, we realized that when you do the Palatino flap, I mean, it's very easy to include in the palatina flap sure. and just push it sure. in. So we said, exactly. well, number one, there's a nerve, but there's also an arteriola, so that if you don't cut it, then there's better blood supply for sure. the palatina flap. Sure. So then we record the patients. We did a neuro neurosensory testing and questionnaire. Patient reported outcome, I think, is very important. Absolutely. If you ask the patient, would you do this again? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> for example. And um, so it was very, very favorable. So that's nice. what we do. Nice. Excellent. So, so lateralization of the, of the contents of the canal um, certainly makes sense. Uh, preserving blood supply is always uh, a great thing, of course. For me personally, it's just been from, of course, our Lefort osteotomy days, um, down fracture in the maxilla, inevitably we'd sever that, con that whole, the contents, of course. And, of course. you know, patients every once in a while might complain, of, ah, Doc, you know, my palate feels a little weird, kind of numb, whatever. And in, in a matter of months, they forget about it, if they even think about it at all anymore, et cetera. And uh, bottom line is it's never been a clinically um, relevant uh, issue uh, in terms of, of, of being problem problematic to sever it. And to this day, even with our full arch cases, with immediate reconstruction, um, um, meaning you know, our terminal dentition cases that we're treating with, with immediate placement and immediate teeth, et cetera, um, they're Definitely a number of cases where I'll place an implant literally right into the mm. into that canal and get good stabilization for a good AP spread. Uh, so at any rate, you know, we'll be able to compare and contrast once again, I think, on, on that particular topic, which I think is most relevant to uh, to all of our, our work that we're doing. Yeah. So I also think definitely we'll we'll discuss you know the posterior maxilla. If you have a not only a sinus but also a you need a regurgitation. Yes, regurgitation. Absolutely. We, we looked at our patients and we realized that one third of a patient of the patients need at least a horizontal augmentation, if not vertical, and the sinus when Definitely. you do that. Definitely. And number two, how you advance the flap in a way so the patient's face is not going to be that big. Exactly. Because there is also the technique for that. Yes, exactly. I'm glad you brought that up because that is so important. Um, because what I have found over time, and again, if you practice long enough and follow your own patients, you, you see trends, and some of them are good, and some of them are maybe alarming. And for me, I realized rather quickly that the cases where I had a relatively thin um, alveolar ridge, did my sinus graft, loud approach, everything's great, no problem. 10, 11, 12 years later, I'm seeing these folks back, and boy, uh, there's um, recession facial, abutment showing, and where I had lack of attachment, now I've got periimplantitis almost to the person. So I realized rather quickly that um, uh, for sure augmentation would be in order uh, and definitely simultaneous with the sinus graft, yes. And then fast forward to, what, five, six years ago or so with Daftari and Bahat showing craniofacial growth happening throughout our lifetime. It doesn't just stop at the growth spurts and then uh, Bahad himself saying, really, we should augment for more uh, with across the board, including using Elloderm, yeah. which I thought was interesting uh, for him to even talk about that. But bottom line is, you know, we're looking at not so much the two millimeter number that, of course, um, our colleagues have talked about forever um, in terms of good aesthetic results for bone and tissue in the aesthetic zone, certainly, um, but but even more so now. So for me. The four millimeter number is makes more sense, and uh, so therefore that's that's the augmentation I look mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. uh, across the board, which really does tails into you know crestal approaches that a lot of folks are promoting. I certainly like that too for a number of our cases. However, um, in again situations where we have a width discrepancy, you know, it's really better to do a lateral approach. Your windows there. You can, you're open, of course, with um, surface release incisions, et cetera. 
and you can address both the arch for alveolar ridge rather for right. width and, and height as well as your your sinus so yeah i think that's going to be real important that we um are able to share that with our audience uh on on Every how evening. to do it and you know in terms of diagnostics and treatment planning in general i think will be at the heart of everything we're going to be able to showcase for those two days and i think you'll agree there'll be two action-packed days and as you said earlier we'll have time to develop our respective protocols so that the audience can really appreciate probably for the first time in any format uh, that we have that time to, to show them sequentially how we do things so they can go back and depending on their where that on their learning curve do it and I think also it will be a very important part that we show what happens in 10 years yes <laughs> yes because that yes. Uh, you know you hear so many things exactly and and so many lectures and 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 I I just look at a picture and I know that that ball is not going to be there yeah, exactly. not 10 years not five years in three years exactly and, and I think you just said a mouthful no pun intended absolutely that you know we each have respective cases that date back so far and, and just along that that topic quickly um, that's why the danger of, of social media can be so uh, deceiving where we see a lot of posting with folks showing what they did last month last week this morning right now you know etc but show me those case those cases show us those cases in five or ten years and in fact better yet why don't we just have a format for cases that are five or maybe ten years post prosthetic completion let's show those yeah. and see what exactly. we've got so yeah I, exactly. I agree I think that's exactly. going to be probably at the heart of what we each present that we have long-term follow-up Right. on cases that will validate yeah. what we're doing today. Yeah, I, 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 you know, there's two things. Number one, when I look at my long-term cases, I still learn. Absolutely. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> and the, the good thing is that most of the cases have a good way of documentation from the beginning. So I know exactly what I did. Sure, you can pinpoint. And then I look at this. Yeah. You know, first I thought one year, Perfect. Everything is going to be perfect. Yeah. Then five years. The patient is back in ten years, <laughs> and the patient is back in fifteen years. Yes. And then so um, I think this is very important. That I think also when you see a lecture, and there's absolutely no follow-ups, that it's that so is, frightening. That can be uh, so frightening. You know, sure, dangerous sure. Sure. because maybe even the, the lecturer doesn't yeah. know what's going to happen. And and complications as well. I mean to to go everything, show everything, and, and, and not even address, you know, what, you know, good, bad, and ugly. You know, the ugly is there. So we need to, you know, the elephant's in the room. We've got to talk about it and show it and, and, and deal with it. And, that, you know, we're human. We have our complications absolutely to this day. You know, for me, 35 years later, are you kidding? Um, and, and in mentoring my own daughter, who's a periodontist, that's joined us now a year and a few months in practice, you know, I try to tell her, look, your dad still has complications. Don't think, you know, I'm invincible, not even close. And as you said so well, I mean, that's perfect. We definitely learn from our own cases as they come back, absolutely.